My lecture today addresses the three centuries of witch persecutions and prosecutions running roughly from 1400 to 1700. As I do not regard three centuries of witch hunts and witch trials as one of the great ideas in philosophy, I probably should say just what it is about this spectacle that requires inclusion in a course of lectures of this kind. The witch hunts were not a willy-nilly affair. They were based on deeply thought out considerations on the nature of sin, the nature of human nature, the nature of law, and the nature of crime and punishment. The witch hunt would feature centrally the known science of the period. It would feature medical specialists, if not medical specialists, well, specialists in certain fields of inquiry, which I am happy to say no longer feature specialists. We don't have people pricking bodies to find out where the devil's spot is, or floating women in pools to determine whether their souls weigh less or more. So certain specialties do come and go, and for some we can say good riddance. The witch hunts and the witch persecutions tell us something about the intellectual ethos, not just of an epic, not just of, let's say, 1450 to 1500, but the broad intellectual ethos of a period that spans centuries, and most importantly, perhaps for present purposes, spans periods of time in which the modern world will be introduced to extraordinary, great scientific achievements. The witch hunts and witch persecutions are still going on when Descartes is alive and Newton and Galileo. They are at a fever pitch in the age of Copernicus and then Kepler and Tycho Brahe. So this isn't some activity in some backwater engaged in by superstitious people who really have no idea of what's happening. This is an official systematic program of arrest, interrogation, trial procedure, the application of developed principles of Roman law presided over by magistrates and figures with the right education. Some of the best people are engaged in this importantly. There are documents written and drafted and promulgated that alert officials as to how these trials are to be conducted, how the punishment must fit the crime the conditions under which an admission of guilt will be acceptable to the court. And all along, determining whether the alleged witch actually is a witch by using the best techniques, the best evidence, the best scientific and technical information and procedure available at the time. This is an important chapter. And it's also an illuminating chapter. Every age has its witches. And every age has a theory that confirms the fact that those targeted for particular abuse or those suffering uh, particular attention and uh, scrutiny are really the right ones. It's usually based on the view that someone's conduct or perspective, someone's theory, is so unorthodox as to constitute a, a threat to the received wisdom and the core values that otherwise keep the community together. Now, whether or not you call such a person a witch depends on the discursive practices of the time. But the idea behind it is very often the same idea. The history of law, I should note, includes ample evidence that witchcraft has been a common target of the law's concern. Western law made provision for witches from Roman times until the 19th century. Even the ancient Greeks had to deal with property damage brought about by witchcraft. The Homeric epics and tragedies offer such, such witches as Circe and Medea. But by the time of Horace and Lucan, the genre is closer to what one thinks of today. By the middle of the 19th century, this entire way of understanding offenses would be relegated to the dustbins of failed theory as the rise of medical jurisprudence replaced the witch theory with, uh, alas, the brain theory. But even in the middle of the 19th century, adjudication in cases of insanity were understood partly in terms of what? The phases of the moon. So old ideas do have great staying power, 
when they play into our most cherished prejudices. The Romans understood witches, I suspect, the way anybody who believes in witches today would understand them, namely, as people who have or seem to have special powers, or think they do, uh, but are beyond our own powers of explanation to figure out just uh, how they came by them. The witch may not have formidable powers, but they seem to claim to have different powers beyond what is naturally achieved. There are, for example, herbalists in ancient Rome, women whose husbands perhaps have died. They have no visible means of support other than moving their little carts through the streets of Rome and taking out a specially grown bit of basil or parsley or oregano and mixing some sort of concoction to cure warts or insomnia or even to instigate hallucinations. Now there are people doing this. They're, they're plying their trades, trades of this kind, harmlessly, perhaps even sometimes laughably. So what we have here are the performances of that class of benevolent witches which the Romans referred to as Lamia, uh, or the good witch, or the white witch, and um, in fact practicing what then was regarded as white magic. Roman law took no notice of this at all. People going around and doing things like this just went around doing things like this. A sophisticated and skeptical Roman would say that anybody who's credulous enough to pay for this sort of thing deserves everything he gets, but there really isn't any reason to clog the courts with matters of this kind. And by and large, the pre-Christian world deals with so-called white witchery, uh, harmless witches, in just this way. However, Roman law did take particular notice of forms of witchcraft that were harmful or destructive. And it's interesting how ancient Roman law does deal with this. The witches who are judged to be responsible for the death of cattle or for barns burning and uh, uh, now will face pe the penalties of law. But where these are determined, these very penalties are determined solely by the damage done. In other words, it's not because it was brought about by witchcraft. If in fact you are responsible for something happening, then the penalty is going to be brought down on you for having been responsible. If you did it by way of witchcraft, fine. If you did it by way of intentional design or because you're a paid arsonist, the law doesn't particularly uh, find itself deeply concerned with underlying patterns of motivation or even the sources of the power that you had to do this. Rather, it is that you did it. The law's position in the ancient world is very much of the sort, what did you do and in the circumstance could you have done otherwise? We leave it to the playwrights to plumb the depths of human psychology. We leave it to the philosophers to tell us what the healthy mind and the insane mind might look like. But the law is concerned with the act and its consequences. So that's where the ancient Roman law stood on matters of this sort. Christianity, however, introduces a new set of problems as regards witchery. Now I want to move carefully here to cover this complex matter within a very brief time. Central to Christian moral teaching is that our worthiness for praise and blame is logically tied to our moral freedom. You do not praise one for falling at a rate of 32 feet per second per second. The laws of physics guarantee that an object is going to fall with that acceleration. So we never say, my, how fast you are. That's not a cause for praise. And if you're dropped out a window and you fall at 32 feet per second per second and land on someone causing bodily harm, we do not charge you with a moral offense, let alone a crime. We say, for goodness sake, this poor person was thrown out the window and landed on someone. The damage was done in effect, the damage was done by a physical object falling from a height. And it just happens to be the case that the physical object was, let's say, Bill. So praise and blame are reserved for those actions over which we do have moral control. Those things that come about as a result of our intentions. In the law, this is referred to as mens rea. One must have the power to frame the evil intent in the mind. 
the mind itself has to be corrupted, mens rea. Now this, of course, is, an, is, is coextensive with juridical reasoning since a time out of memory. The law punishes what the actor does when the actor in the circumstance could have done otherwise. And there have always been throughout the history of law the mitigating circumstances of coercion or sickness, insanity, conditions of that sort. But I say the emphasis that Christian teaching will place on moral freedom is a new and more significant emphasis because the stakes now have to do with nothing less than eternal salvation. Now part of this teaching is that the powers of Satan cannot be deployed in such a way as to rob us of our moral freedom because if that were the case there then would be no basis upon which to judge us at all. How could you ever tease out the difference between someone acting in a malign way by intention and someone whose intentions had been corrupted by the devil, that in fact the person was merely an instrument of satanic purposes. So there's a very strong presumption then of moral autonomy. Now on this understanding, how do you account for any supernatural event? Well, take the words literally, supernatural, something that is above and beyond what is naturally produced. These come in a variety of forms. The most popular, of course, are miracles, miraculous events. David Hume, perhaps somewhat playfully, would come to describe a miracle as the suspension of a law of nature. Well, this really is the ordinary sense of the miraculous. That is, what all of the forces of nature routinely bring about now is not being brought about. Indeed, something is being brought about that you almost would never see happen in the natural course of events. Well, suppose now a person had such supernatural powers, someone who can bring about something that no one else can, or that very few ever have. What do you say about such a person? You might say that they're performing miracles and should be understood as saints. Some people in this period were performing what were regarded as miraculous cures, and indeed they were understood to be saints. But the actions of the witch fall outside the pattern and the possibilities of nature, and not in a saintly way. Now a power that is above nature can have only two sources. Almighty God, who has all the powers that go beyond the powers of the natural, and the devil, who also has formidable unnatural powers. Now if the witch has supernatural power, and if the witch's supernatural power is by way of the devil, what difference would it make whether what she does is useful or harmful? Obviously, she must have in some way, if only implicitly, accepted the devil's help here, what in the period of the witch hunts will be called her entering into a pactum implicitum. There's an implicit pact. Otherwise, the devil could willy-nilly take control of one's autonomy, make us instruments of his malign purposes, etc. So there must either be an explicit or an implicit pact that is formed a kind of Faustian pact. I'll give you my soul, so to speak, if you grant me these powers. Well now, this puts an entirely different face on the act of witchery, for it now becomes the crime of heresy. And as such, it becomes a matter of small consequence whether the witchery is for good or for evil, whether its principal effect is negligible or indeed colossal. The witch, if acknowledging herself to be a witch, has entered into a pact, if only an implicit one, and that pact itself constitutes the life of the heretic. Acts of heresy are punishable and indeed punishable by death. So the witch theory, coming out of a more fundamental theological theory, a theological hyphen scientific theory regarding the order of nature and the grounds on which anything can escape the order of nature, offers a radically different explanation of witchcraft and lays the foundation for trials now taken to be 
of the utmost importance. Now, by this time, formal trial procedures had already been rediscovered, replacing medieval tests of trial and ordeal. The 13th century European courts, both secular and ecclesiastical, were in full possession of Roman legal procedure. One of the benefits of the recovery and dissemination of Roman law was the replacement, or at least the augmentation, of the accusatorial scheme with an inquisitorial procedure. But this proved to be a mixed blessing. Beginning with Alexander IV's papal bull of 1258, which gave impetus to inquisition into all forms of heresy and extending to Innocent VIII's uh, treatise on the same subject, his papal bull on, on the same subject, the fate of witches proved to be sealed. Now let me pursue here briefly and note the differences between the two schemes for bringing charges against anyone. Before the recovery and the reapplication of developed Roman law, complaints between parties were generally in the form of accusations. Smith accuses Jones of doing something. Now Smith and Jones bring their cases before the relevant tribunal. Smith, as the accuser, must make his case, and if he fails, he faces multiple penalties, including a counteraction brought against him. I'm referring here now to the accusatorial procedure. Well, this puts some sort of a ceiling on the kinds of accusations that will be brought against people, discouraging those that uh, would otherwise have merely petty and, and frivolous accusations to make. In the medieval period, the way some of the more serious charges were judged was through trial, ordeal, and compurgation. A defendant could choose between trial by jury or by God. Now, in the latter case, and under the supervision of, uh, of a coroner, the defendant would pass barefoot over burning coals or would carry white-hot metal by hand, tested in scalding water for burns. It's a credit to the church that it was instrumental in putting such practices to an end. Indeed, the practice survived in many Scandinavian provinces until the 18th century. Referring here to these ordeals now. Com Compurgation was based on a different principle. Here, the defendant was required to summon a fixed number of persons willing to swear before God that they believe the defendant's oath of innocence. Now, the outcome of this sort of procedure depended as much on the faithful performance of the required procedures as on the credibility of the compurgators. You had to have persons of some standing to serve as your compurgators. Now, this, too, was a mode of trial abandoned as Roman law was more fully absorbed by the now more studious and classically committed West. In 1164, for example, the constitutions of Clarendon in Britain eliminated compurgation from procedures involving felonies. Ecclesiastical courts, however, retained this system until well into the 17th century, but even this would be of no avail to those charged with witchcraft. For them, there were not to be witnesses for the defense. On the whole, the inquisitorial procedure was an advance in adjudication. Through it, the authorities did not have to wait for a complaint, but could actually bring an action, engage in an inquisition, compile the evidence, take testimony from parties to the dispute, and then the court itself could order appropriate remedies. When properly applied, the inquisitorial procedure functioned much like what today would be a grand jury procedure in our system of law. But it worked very much to the disadvantage of those tried for witchcraft, because now the accuser did not have to face the accused. The inquisitor could bring the charge, ask all sorts of questions, and never divulge the name of those, the names of those who made the, ac the accusation or the complaint. Unique to the witch prosecutions, defendants did not have an opportunity to face accusers. And the explanation for this was that the very powers of witchcraft could be brought down on such accusers who, knowing that, would not give faithful testimony. 
You see the catch-22 here. Torture was permitted, but no confession made in the torture chamber could count as evidence against the witch. Rather, a period of time had to elapse, two or three days, and then the same admission would have to be made in open court. Torture typically was not needed, however, because many charged with witchcraft actually admitted to the charge. You do get the picture here. What we have are eccentric, often rather troubled people, 80 to 90 percent of whom were women, generally older women, often unattached, not at a very high level in society, not at a very high level of education. Now, statistics here are hard to come by, but this pattern was the general pattern. The number of executions cited in the literature ranges from hundreds of thousands to a million and upwards. The, the extreme values, I think, are less than credible. But clearly, the victims must have been various in personality, age, overall condition of mental and physical health. That women were utterly, disproportionately suspected and targeted, there is no doubt. Father Nicholas Remy, for example, who had been appointed to the inquisitorial tribunal in Alsace in 1570, wrote a treatise on demonolatry and concluded on the issue of witches that, quote, here's Father Remy, it is not unreasonable that this scum of humanity should be drawn chiefly from the feminine sex, close quote. Interestingly, with few exceptions, the insanity defense was not a plea in these cases. And in fact, given the nature of the witch theory, it couldn't have mattered much in any case. Witches had very little by way of self-defense in these actions, and their execution could have uh, the necessary chilling effect that was sought by both ecclesiastical and secular courts. Putting a better face on it, the church authorities knew that it was far more important to save the soul than to preserve the body of the witch. And if burning the witch is a means to salvation, then in the flames one will find redemption. Again, the picture, I think, is a fairly clear one. Now, what of evidence? These courts were serious places. The magistrates, we have reason to believe, were honorable men. What kind of evidence is relevant in a trial for witchcraft? The offenses themselves cannot be enough, for such outcomes could arise from accident or from uncomplicated criminal motives. So the evidence needed to pertain to the basis upon which the defendant stands as a witch. It would not be sufficient that someone had accused another of witchery. Rather, substantial and incriminating evidence would be required. Well, how do you do this? First, the courts require a document or text or rational plan for dealing with cases of this kind. Needed here is a special kind of expertise, the right kind of learning, to lay out the salient characteristics of the witch and how these are uncovered through the right kind of examination. In a word, you need a book a book that tells you what the right punishment is. You need a book that sets forth the theory of the witch, the basis upon which one comes to be a witch, etc. Now once this is in place, trial procedures and evidence, and indeed uh, sentencing, can be applied in an even-handed way. Well, alas, there was a book. The book is the infamous Malleus Maleficarum. The authors were two Dominicans, and the Pope had put his seal of approval on this book, as did kings and princes throughout Europe. So this was a book in place, reaching a prominent position comparable to that of the Bible itself over the course of its numerous printings. It was authoritative. It had the Pope's seal, the King's seal, the seal of princes, the Malleus Maleficarum. Now what we discover in the book is this. First, there is to be no doubt as to the existence of witches. Against those who have expressed skepticism toward the very concept of witchcraft, the Malleus presents a less than gentle threat, and I quote, whether the belief that there are such beings as witches is so essential a part of the Catholic faith 
that obstinacy to maintain the opposite opinion manifestly savors of heresy. Aha! This is a theory that you must accept. Now this is the proposition that opens the work and provides the occasion for a sick et known discussion, which concludes with the firm judgment, you see they will weigh alternative uh, views, but end with this judgment, whosoever thinks otherwise concerning these matters is a heretic. So this is a sort of shut up, I explained kind of explanation. Now, trials are to proceed, says the Malleus, in the simplest and most straightforward manner, quote, without legal quibbles and contentions which are introduced in other cases, close quote. In other words, get on with it. And moreover, although the witch is to have the benefit of an advocate, try this now, quote, the judge must admonish him, the advocate, not to incur the charge of defending heresy, which would make him liable to excommunication, close quote. The witch hasn't got a chance. Now on the matter of evidence, it is sufficient to note that the witch has entered into a pact with the devil and thus has lost the capacity for remorse. What that means then is that what a God-fearing and good Christian person would find so melancholy and woeful as to weep over, the witch will not weep over. And so if you approach the witch with an official text to be recited seriously and somberly regarding the love that Mary had for her dying son, whose blood was spilled for our salvation. I say, if you go down the list, reminding this person of the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, God made man for her and her salvation, and after you've given this full account, you point to her and say, now do you cry, and no tear forms. This at least is strongly suggestive evidence that you are dealing with a witch. It's the tear test. When James I of England wrote his little treatise on demonology, it's something he backed away from a little later in life, but when he first considered the matter and discussed the tear test, he not only summarizes the tear test, but then he warns us this way. He says, quote, Beware, lest you be gulled by the tears of the crocodilia the tears of the crocodile, or as we say, crocodile tears. So even if you form tears, you may not uh, be quite uh, exonerated if there is some reason to believe that these are not authentic tears. And by the way, in case you're wondering, yes, one of the characteristics of aging is dry eye. We have whole clinics set up to deal with dry eye, and it would not at all be uncommon for postmenopausal women particularly with not an especially wholesome regimen to be incapable of normal lacrimation. Well, um, they didn't know about dry eye, but uh, in any case they would have had a different theory to account for it. Now let me turn to the flotation test. This was another part of the forensics of the period, administered in different ways. In some instances the woman was suspended by shafts over a pool of blessed water. Now if the water accepts her, as proved by her sinking in it, she is innocent. But if she floats, well now this is evidence of being rejected by the baptismal medium, and it's a sign of guilt. Osteoporosis, by the way, is something that is going to be uh, commented on in the 16th century by Johannes Weyer, uh, stridently anti-Catholic, Nonetheless, a physician ahead of his time in many ways, still one who accepts that there are witches. But Weyer debunks these trial procedures and notes that older women float chiefly because of the lightness of their brittle bones, and insists that many of the defendants in the witch trials are simply of unsound mind. Now this is Weyer, whose dates are 1515 to 1588. It should be noted he was born in Holland, he had been greatly influenced by the writings of, yes, Erasmus, and had studied medicine in Paris as a contemporary of, of Vesalius. His classic treatise on demonology put the witch theory on notice, and was, of course, condemned by both the Protestant and the Catholic faculties at all of the major universities. 
If he is, as some contend, the father of modern psychiatry, he's also one fully steeped in the alchemical and even demonological theories of his time. But his attack on the witch trials was laudable nonetheless. Now, the most degrading test of all was the test administered by the witch pricker, pricking parts of a now naked body in all the private recesses of that body to find out where the devil left his mark. You begin to see the degradation suffered by those charged with the heresy of witchcraft. And you also begin to see how easily a wrong-headed theory, gaining support from an undeveloped science, can wreak nothing but misery and shame on the victims of an age steeped in strident ignorance, at least on this central point. We must be careful with our theories, mustn't we? <laughs>